Gujarat in 2002, so I knew how the program was, was carried out. Um, but I was much more concerned about, uh, and that is something that is very well known and well documented by many. You call it an experiment because that's where it took its most complete form. And uh, that's where the political project uh, uh, came to maturity. Uh, and I say call it a political pro uh, project for very specific reason that it's not just the larger kind of uh, project that's associated with Hindut uh, or the Hindu right as you call it or the BJP and the RSS but it uh, became very pointed um, in uh, how it's going to manage its state power okay the concentration of authority in the person of one man um, and the great um, euphoria that was whipped up around it that I think is what is specific to it. The way it would manage, for instance, the Westminster model, uh, the cabinet system, for instance, or um, party being elected and finding a uh, place in the Vidhan Sabha. Right. These were all hand-picked people. You had the cabinet, which was hand-picked again, but which was faceless. During that period, you wouldn't often know who's handling which portfolio. Uh, because the high profile projection of one man and then um, um, uh, carrying on the government with the help of the chief minister and his chosen group of IS and IPS officers that is the model that you saw and that is the model that has been carried over so that's why I say that the Westminster model was something that had been negated set aside effectively although it was kept um, sort of a museum piece it was there and people could refer to it and would look that everything is normal the way it's been going there's no great departure but there was a substantial departure in the sense that the substance of that uh, form of representation division of power allocation of um, um, responsibilities accountability for those responsibilities had all shifted um, quite dramatically and decisively in building up one man show okay. that is the model of development that was actually in operation and of course the 2002 program was uh, something that was organized by the larger right-wing fraternity that was there and uh, I don't think that we have the time to talk about it and I don't think there's need to talk about it for the simple reason that it's already been documented but I was in the university so what I saw at much close quarter was how the university would be um, penetrated and taken over as an institution and if you were to put it in very simple terms it was the, it's the a university has got you know an architecture of autonomy which you can um, say is twofold uh, the university is an autonomous body vis-a-vis -vis the government right so uh, it is self-contained in that sense because it is geared to the specific purpose of ensuring long-term goals in education and research at the highest level right so that university has to have an autonomy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the government it can't be just a handmaiden of the government it's not a department of the government but effectively, this um, entire thing was um, sort of eroded very effectively. It became almost impossible to decide where um, the vice chancellors of the university or people heading institutions like deans of the faculty uh, were um, uh, working as autonomous uh, um, uh, officials of the university or they had become, you know, just extensions of the, of the government. And there's a complex process through which it was, uh, it was done as to how to make the government a far bigger uh, force within the university but its method was that the autonomy of the university was just become a figment of constitutional imagination it didn't have anything beyond that and you would therefore begin the process was to go ahead with a top-down kind of a way of um, uh, taking over the university you take control of the vice chancellor you take, plant as many of your people into its governing bodies, such as the executive, because there's a large number of people who are either associated with the government, uh, government nominees, or uh, who have been, uh, 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 who are ex officio members. They hold certain positions with the government, and the constitution of the university allows you to put, uh, say, the director of higher education. So there would be four or five of these positions within the executive body, which is called the syndicate, and uh, and. Um, the rest would come as nominees of the government. You have four nominees on the um, syndicate. So you've already got eight of these figures. Then there's a vice chancellor and the pro vice chancellor and the registrar. So there's 11 in a body which is of 25. You've already got 11 people. And then there would be um, um, 
uh, people who would be elected right and that electorate itself could be then controlled you have to manage numbers so then you control that electorate and there's a complex kind of process through which you go about doing it but the most important thing is that if um, you know, important people in the university begin to see that there is no way out of this situation they begin to be the, if, if not complicit they uh, um, they begin to conform to whatever the diktats are coming from from the government um, so <clears throat> the university was taken over in this in that sense and uh, the head of the departments for instance departments are also the second level at tier at uh, level at which the university is autonomous a as it's, it's autonomous vis-a-vis -vis the government of the day b it is autonomous internally right so there is a kind of a series of interlocking kind of autonomies so the department is autonomous vis-a-vis -vis the faculty where the faculty is autonomous vis-a-vis -vis the syndicate within the departments um, uh, the faculty are autonomous with reference to the areas of specialization yeah you can't have a person specializing in x telling a person with specialization in y that this is what you should teach and this is what you should represent right so there is an entire architecture internal architecture of autonomies and the um, uh, in terms of um, education in terms of the courses that you offer in terms of research as well you have what's called the board of studies right each department has a board of studies which decides um, uh, what are the courses you're going to teach vetting of those courses revision of those courses overhauling those whatever it is not there's the vice chancellor can't tell me that this course you're going to teach and this you, you are not going to teach so all those autonomies had to be eroded sort and put uh, brought under command sort of so you begin at the top with the vice chancellor then you want to see who, who are the deans who would be you know uh, compliant with our diktats those that are supposed to be um, uh, uh, would resist it uh, would be left behind they would be come across any number of cases where people who would have legitimately been deans have not become deans uh, people who could have become heads of departments were not allowed to be to become heads of departments and if they didn't find so all these people should be uh, um, uh, recruited with an eye on how would they uh, not offer resistance not have a mind of their own but would conform to the diktats as they were it was sweeping down from the government education department uh, into the university via the vice chancellor right? and it was just it also would create the sense of you know cohesiveness when people are autonomous and exercise their own decisions it could be a uh, it could be um, it's not an easy process there's a lot of back and forth and um, discussions deliberations even um, uh, disagreements okay that all that goes on so somehow it gives you there's a sense of cohesiveness an order that has been thundered down it passes down the line and we have um, uh, reduced the chances of um, any kind of infringement of that by saying that the personnel that we are appointing as uh, deans of faculties or a heads of departments are people who would we are pretty sure would conform to what we want those and in cases where such people are not available you will keep the position vacant so all those te 10 15 years it started i think somewhere in the late 90s this process um and it's not over it continues down to this day it's become stable in that sense 50% on a rough count 50% of the department remained without heads right they were not um those that were in position were often continued through perversions of statutory provisions if you've done a term you there's rotation of headship you don't want the next person to come in so what you would do is to your chosen head of the department would be continued his term would be extended on one specious ground or another in infringing the provisions of the constitution but who cares about that so and that this went all the way up if faculties you didn't find uh, the right kind of people then the faculties would be a, one uh, one dean would be looking after three four faculties one dean would be looking after four five six departments where you don't have regular heads okay that was the method of taking over the university and so the university becomes overall compliant loses its spine loses its autonomy uh, and um, um faculty being promoted on the criterion of closeness to cliques um uh and the cliques happened to be that. so basically that's that's what happened it was very clear that it, it's not a wavered thing it's not something that uh, applies to one university there are some specific things that apply to 
universities. In our university, it happens to be one of the most cosmopolitan universities that was created by a very enlightened um, ruler, um, Sergi Rao Gaikwad, right? Um, and it's one university, though it might be in, the, uh, in a state, and many would outside Gujarat regard it as a provincial university, but it was a university that was in many ways um, international in its scope, you know, the kind of faculty that it would include. Just remember that uh, the famous Indian sociologist, M. N. Srinivas, did a stint in, in Baroda. And he was the one who built the Department of Sociology before he moved here, I think, to London School of Economics. Or where did he go? I don't know exactly. And with, um, um, a very key figure in the development of modern sociology was there. Right? So, and it was one university which had, uh, uh, through the Gujarati diaspora, had links with UK, the large Gujarati com uh, communities in UK and uh, US. And this was probably one of the first universities in that in the, um, I think the late 90s or the early part of the 20th century, uh, got wired, you know, there was, um, these uh, um, the alumni of the university working in Silicon Valley, they came and connected the university with the internet. I don't think that any university in Delhi had that, but it was interconnected. It was that kind, kind of a place. It has the famous faculty of fine arts, right? Um, it might have been, you know, um, tamed to quite an extent, but it, the international reputation of the university uh, had to do with the phalanx of artists that they produced um, within the university or with the city of Baruda itself. Bhupen Kakkar, for instance, Ghulam Sher, Neelma Sher, um, uh, several of them, you know, um, uh, Manida. So, so many of them. And so there was this quite an exper experiment in the, in the, around the late 40s and 50s by this um, famous uh, professor uh, and the vice chancellor, rather, the vice chancellor of the uh, um, of university, Shrimati Hansa Mehta. So uh, she, she uh, brought in Frank Trank University. It must be the first university where you have a faculty of performing arts. Okay, so these were the um, uh, great features that were present. And it was the ex the most uh, outstanding thing about the university was that it's the only English language university in in Gujarat. Uh, so that might be a special reason why you know that percolation of Western discourses, which would be held suspect, would bring about an inordinate kind of an attention of the uh, cultural and the political right. And they got rather active. In controlling it, on the presumption that all these people, you know, who are wavered in their scheme of things, you know, fine arts faculty, um, uh, all kinds of, you know, attributes they would read into um, uh, into it, um, uh, promiscuous, you know, not conforming to a set model, um, and acting, behaving, carrying on their lives in a wavered fashion, according to this. So it it would invite special attention so it became a part of you know social engineering and it becomes very important how to take over a university because this is a university that could stage agitations could resist the government uh, it had a very active teachers association and it was the teachers association in Baroda which in the first instance when the government was introducing the common university act in 2004 and had brought out um, almost surreptitiously uh, an ordinance which was supposed to be the instrument going to be the future instrument through which all universities would be linked together. There would be um, a centralization of um, authority. Um, teachers could be transferred from one, the, bringing in you know the idea of uh, transferable jobs within the university, etc., etc. All those, uh, some of those very uh, good things attached to it that you know that credits could be transferred from one place to another place. Later on, they would thunder down the semester system, bypassing all. Um, 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 well-evolved systems of deliberation before you adopt uh, new methods or new pedagogies or new way of organizing your courses all this so in that sense MS University was a part of that scheme of thing but it was also special the challenge was how to take over a university which has an identity of its own which is to, uh, in English right and is therefore uh, the place from which Western discourses can percolate into the society how to take over of that, take over that university. Um, of course, there are limits to any government as to how much it can take over. It can't, it wants to be totalitarian, it wants to control everything, but it doesn't succeed in controlling everything. There's 
there are many important things that slip out of it. And at some stage, they realize that Gujarat has been called the laboratory of the right. It's a laboratory because you have successfully carried out um, um, the taking over of the university and making a part of the structure of power the way you were articulating it and laying it down in those crucial years in the late 90s um, uh, till, till now. But the whole idea of universities is that they are autonomous institutions. They're not government institutions. Okay, So they have to be governed un under different codes. And there has to be a necessary distance between all universities. If they are to serve the society, if they are not going to be handmaidens of the government of the day, then if they are going to be long-lasting institutions of the people, then they must be autonomous of whatever may be the policies or whatever may be the outlook of the government, whether of the light, right or the left. Right? So in the long-term interest of education, and education is a vital good, education is a vital good of the society, must see to it that in the whole uh, framework of democracy, universities are kept autonomous of the government and do not fall under any excessive kind of penetration of uh, political parties per se, whether of the right or the left. Now, that is a part of, you know, um, uh, that's, uh, that's a, the second thing is that if universities fall under the control of, you know, parochial or nar narrow-minded or short-sighted ideologies, then the long-term interests of the people are not served. They, come, they, they, they begin to look uh, at sectarian things, right? And then they would not be uh, creating cultures which are inclusive, which allows people coming from diverse backgrounds, uh, as well as deprived people um, who are on the margins, empowering themselves through acquiring skills, being given an opportunity in a new institution where they can um, empower themselves with skills and uh, new ideas and they become to begin to look at the world universities are supposed to be called universities because one of the things vital things that they are going to impart is a universality of outlook right universities across the world let alone being within nation states universities across the world have to be in conversation with each other have to be in touch with each other okay so and they are by their nature they are um, inclusive they are not uh, religious bodies they are not madrasas they are not mats which are religion specific or caste specific okay they are meant for they are classically democratic anyone who is able to make it to a university will make it regardless of his caste and creed so it has to be inclusive but you must also recognize that academic there is something called uh, citizenship which we are grappling with uh, a citizen is invested with certain inalienable rights as given in the Constitution of India, right? The right to free speech, the right to freedom of expression, the right to consciousness. And consciousness means that I should be able to inquire what I want to inquire into. And that should be treated as something that is sacrosanct. Now, um, being a part of the faculty of coming to the university is becoming, is being a... Um, uh, um, is assimilated into this culture of academic citizenship right is academic citizenship and the rights of an academic or someone who is in the university as a student and as a faculty are nothing but a specific um, uh, a specific um, um, uh, uh, um, elaboration of the rights of a citizen the right to inquire the right to choose disciplines the right to pursue a certain line of um, research, the right to take certain courses, the right for certain courses to be framed. Right? The entire ranges of autonomous elements that are involved in the functioning of the university. So, and, and the fourth thing that I would like to mention, that universities are the place where adults, regardless of the backgrounds from which I'm coming in terms of regions or ethnicities or languages, or caste affiliations, religious associations, adults come together and act. The university is a kind of a bridge through which these young adults cross over into maturity. They form long-standing um, affinities and commitments with people coming from different sections. Right? And the university is, should be like that, that umbrella that allows that flow of um, youthful energy 
give it a certain direction so that it's not controlled by uh, uh, things that are narrow, things, things that are limited, things that are parochial. It's an expansion of the mind. It's actually enabling you of the energies, enabling these young people, of the energies that exist within them to be able to ch channelize, to be uh, concretized, to be fleshed. And of course, it allows them to form meaningful relationships, whether of friendship or of collegiality or of love across the bounds of caste and community right so in that sense in that sense it is inclusive uh, it not just in that it includes everyone but it provides the possibility of psychic moral intellectual um, um, integration among people who may belong to diversities but are able to forge common links right and it is um, quintessentially democratic in nature so universities can't be lost or absorbed within uh, the schemes of government it can't be a part of the apparatus of the government and any government that does it and to the extent that it does it uh, hits at the vitals of this institution and therefore endangers the long-term interest of the society of society in which these institutions have been created mm -hmm.